Um, so briefly, uh, I'm going to tell you who I am, and then we'll get straight into the presentation because I think context always matters. Um, so if everybody can see me on the screen, my name is Gene Shu. It's pronounced Shu, like what goes on your foot. I am American by birth, which you can probably tell by my accent, but I am ethnically Chinese. I specialize in Sino-Western cross-cultural communications. I've published books and audiobooks that analyze how Chinese people think, why they behave the way they do, and how to work more constructively with them. Now, why am I on this customer psychology masterclass today? It's because recently I've mastered something that I don't know if it's popular in the UK, but it's really popular here in the US. It's called door-to-door -door sales. And this is the most basic direct consumer sales activity, all right? So I learned how it is taught to new sales reps when they enter the business. I discovered shortcomings in the training methods of this business, and I improved how to teach it back as part of building a sales team for this business. Now you'll notice that I use the term business because in this business, there's a proven sales training system that was designed to do a couple things, obviously help people achieve sales, but it's also designed to weed out those people who don't have the characteristics to thrive within it. It's actually called QTQP, Quality Talk with Quality People. So the training program isn't intended to successfully close the maximum number of prospects. It actually is based on what they call the law of averages, which means as a salesperson for this business, you're trying to reach the maximum number of low hanging fruit prospects and convince them to buy rather than develop the most persuasive method to actually be able to work with anybody. All right. So this is uh, a rolling one month sales ranking after I'd only been in this business less than eight weeks. You can see that I'm already at the top of everybody who's selling door to door. And what I've done is what I've called, I've called I've mastered the field. And I did that by adapting what I knew from my cross-cultural communications experience and applying it to this direct door-to-door -door sales business. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So today we're going to try to make it more of a workshop. We're going to take QTQP out of the tactics of the door-to-door -door or the direct-to-consumer selling. Because our job in this workshop is to understand how to be more influential to the people we're trying to convince to buy something, not try to optimize how many people we can reach. So we're gonna take QTQP out of the equation. We're gonna highlight psychological factors to overcome more customer objections. Now in QTQP, uh, what you're taught is if you don't see a buying sign, then you should just move on to the next customer. We're not gonna do that today. We're gonna figure out how do we overcome even the most intense customer objections if your job is to learn how to be more persuasive by understanding customer psychology. And then we're going to socialize, socialize what, when, and how to influence your customers in a positive way. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this door-to-door -door sales training system by Frontier. Frontier is a fiber optic internet service provider. And what we're going to do is we're going to examine the customer psychology of when they train you or teach you what to say versus what we want to accomplish today, not just knowing what to say, because every person and every prospect, it's different, but we're going to try to learn, figure out knowing what, when, and why to say what we say in order to get the maximum amount of influence and the maximum chance of convincing your customers to take the action that you want them to take, all right? So in this sales training program, this is what they teach you. They teach you eight steps to success, which is all about the mentality of being a successful salesperson. We're not gonna talk about that. This is about the psychology of customers. They give you a standard sales pitch, which they call five steps to a conversation. 
This assumes that if you have no experience selling, you don't even know how to have a conversation with a potential customer. They're going to teach you something called Fuji factors. Uh, just for the people who have their videos shared, can you raise your hand if you've heard the term Fuji factors? This is customer psychology 101. Does anybody know what a Fuji factor is? Okay, so for the people who have... Um, who have their videos on, I see nobody does, which is fine. Uh, in this training program, they also give you a field strategy, which means they teach you something called garden theory, which is uh, how you're planting seeds, you're weeding out people who aren't gonna buy from you, and then eventually you harvest your customers. And then you do that based on the law of averages and QTQP. All right, quality talk with quality people. And they try to help you develop some mindsets for success. And one of the things they tell you to say over and over again is assuming the sale, which means you need to assume that the customer is going to say yes. But the problem is when they teach assuming the sale, uh, most of the representatives who go into this business, they don't know how to actually do that. It's one of those things that's easier said than done. Assume the sale. All right. So the first thing is, Fuji factors, since nobody's actually heard of this, it's probably good that we go through it. And the whole point of Fuji factors is to do something called build impulse. Building impulse is basically getting a customer excited where they actually want to buy what you're trying to sell. When they teach it as Fuji factors, it's basically customer psychology without empathy or self-awareness. So for for anybody who's listening right there, right now, um, if you have empathy for the pe person that you're talking to and you have self-awareness about how you are being perceived by the person you're talking to, then you've already clicked all the boxes of having and being able to use customer psychology. Most people lack empathy and self-awareness, which is why they teach it as Fuji factors. So the F in Fuji factors is fear of loss. Uh, so for example, if we knock on the door and, and, and you wanna use the F Fuji factor, you might say something like, these promotions are only available while I'm here today, all right? Which means if they don't decide to sign up, then they may lose the opportunity. That is creating the fear of loss in your prospect. The next one is you, which is urgency. If you want to convince your customers to buy, uh, if you see these online promotions or online things that people are selling, they always say, you, you know, this is a limited time offer. Sign up within the next, uh, you know, these deals are going away. This is people creating a sense of urgency, urgency through customer psychology, which means in this case, your savings will begin as soon as you get installed. All right. Um, that's the you. The J is the Jones effect. Um, you know, a, a long time ago in America, people had this term keeping up with the Joneses where everybody wanted to outcompete their neighbor, have the best looking lawn, have the best looking car, had the best house. Now it's more like uh, keeping up with the Kardashians, whatever the Kardashians are using, that's what you want. Uh, it's creating this Jones effect or Sometimes it's the fear of missing out or even uh, trying to target the greedy impulses that people have. And in the example that we're going to use today, door drawer -door selling, we may say something like, have you talked to your neighbors who have already upgraded? That's using the Jones effect. And the most important thing that I've experienced is the indifference when you're selling. Indifference basically means that you're not coming off as a salesperson. So you might say something like, you know, not everybody needs the latest technology. Uh, I'm just here to see if it makes sense for you. And then you may do some nonverbal cues. Uh, the, the one that we use the most often is panda pause, which is, means you throw up your hands and you just say, you know, I'm just here to see if it makes sense for you. All right. It's almost like you don't really care if they buy or you don't buy. It's basically you're giving them the decision-making authority, do they want to learn more? And that's psychology 101, all right? So in this um, sales training program, 
that Frontier gives new sales representatives, they give you a standard pitch, which is your foundation. So again, this is trying to teach people who've never sold before how to sell. And the only way you can do that is just give them a standard pitch, which they memorize. So there's an introduction, there's a short story, there's a presentation, there's a close, and then there's a rehash. They also give you some product knowledge. So Frontier is a fiber optic internet company. So they're trying to sell against the cable internet companies. So they give you product knowledge on what are the benefits of fiber versus copper coax, which is the older technology. And then of course they give you sales tools and the, uh, or CRMs to help you manage your time in the field. The goal is to build customer impulse, all right? Your goal, whether you're whether you call it trying to sell somebody or you call it trying to influence someone or understanding their psychology, you're trying to get the person in front of you, the person you're selling or marketing to above the buying line. And that's why they call it five steps to a conversation. When you talk to somebody, you've knocked on their door. They don't know who you are. They assume the worst because anybody who knocks on the door and they don't know who you are, they assume you're a solicitor. And the impulse is the customer just wants to get rid of you right away. So you have to figure out in five steps how to get that customer above the buying line. So of course it starts with an intro. You wanna try to create a connection. You wanna try to say some icebreakers to make yourself appear either more friendly or more trustworthy. And then you want to get into kind of a short story, engage in conversation, but you also want to ask your qualifying and disqualifying questions. Find out if this person might be someone who would be interested in what you have to offer. And then if they do, you want to do a quick presentation. Talk about the features and benefits of, in this case, fiber optic internet technology versus the old copper coax technology. And Throughout your conversation, you're building impulse. You're getting people above the buying line because only when you give them above the buying line can you close them, can you assume the sale. And then the last step is to rehash, which is to prevent buyer's remorse. In this business, after a customer gets installed, they can cancel. If they cancel within seven days, then as a salesperson, you don't get paid. So we have a rehash, and that is to make sure that you're not promising anything that you cannot deliver. The customer knows exactly what they're paying for or what they're signing up for, and they're pleasantly surprised at the end. If you have a business where you where customer loyalty is important, the rehash is really important because your loyal customers are going to be the people who give you referrals to your next customer. So this five steps to a conversation basically would work in almost any situation. Now, in the standard training, because in this business, first you learn how to do the business and then you bring in other salespeople and you become mentors and trainers to them and you build a sales team. So everybody can train however they want. And I discovered what was missing in the standard sales training is they teach you well, they practice rebuttals all the time. So how do you, what do you say when a customer says this? What do you say when a customer says this? But they don't teach you the psychology of overcoming customer objections and why they even happen in the first place. We're also conditioned to expect no, because it's based on the law of averages. You're not gonna sell to everybody. So they condition you to accept that customers are gonna reject you. And what they don't do is they don't help you help every customer find yes. So in the case of narrowing this workshop to customer psychology, we want to show you how to convince every single prospect to say yes by understanding the psychology of what they're experiencing when you encounter them or when you interact with them. In the standard training, they learn what to say, but they don't know, they don't learn when and why in the context of customer psychology and managing the perception of customers. And finally, we aren't coached to adapt product knowledge and the standard pitch 
to build trust and to make it make sense for the customers. All right. So what's missing psychologically? All right. So there's a one word answer to this. Um, if anybody wants to type it into the chat or raise their hand, what is the one thing that you think is missing in the training that I've introduced so far for new sales reps? Anybody? You can type it in the chat or you can raise your hand. It's a one word answer. From a customer psychologically psychological standpoint, what's missing in the training? And I used to talk about this all the time and nobody in this business talked about it before. All right, so I don't see any hands. Maybe it's really early in the UK. The answer is permission. All right, so you have to imagine in door-to-door -door sales, when you knock on somebody's door, you haven't been given permission to say anything. Even though most people are courteous to strangers and even to solicitors, all right? So what I'm gonna share with you is how I completely change the standard sales pitch that this business teaches you. Uh, and this is my KISS introduction. KISS, as everybody knows, is keep it short and simple. Uh, and this is my sales pitch, and we're gonna analyze it, uh, why it works better from a psychological standpoint. So the first thing is, I would say, how are you? But I don't make small talk, all right? So one of the things that everybody's trained to do is to, you know, talk about the weather, talk about, you know, you know, somebody has a cool car in the driveway, talk about the car. I just say, how are you? And I don't make small talk. And I go straight into the reason I'm here, okay? Because when a stranger knocks on your door and somebody actually opens the door, the first thing they wanna know is why are you here? So instead of making small talk, I just go directly into the reason that I'm here. So I'll knock on the door with a smile, I'll say, how are you? And they'll say, and then I'll say the reason that I'm here, and then I'll give them that reason. The reason that I'm here is because your entire neighborhood has been upgraded with the latest fiber optic internet technology. All right, so I tell them the reason why I'm here, that's the number one question in their mind, and then I tell them why I'm here, your neighborhood has been upgraded, okay? And then I will say, when that happens, they send annoying people like me, and then I might say, my name is Gene, to see if it makes sense for you to upgrade. So actually I'm saying what's in the customer's mind. They're thinking, oh, some stranger's knocking on my door. I wanna try to get rid of them as soon as possible. Um, so I don't make small talk. I answer the number one question in the customer's mind. I tell them why I'm here. And then I try to interject a little humility or humor. And psychologically, when you do that, it actually projects more confidence, all right? So what you'll notice is I never told them my name because when you're knocking on a stranger's door and they don't know who you are and they're not expecting you and they probably you're disturbing them and they don't want to talk to you, they don't care what your name is. They only want to know why you're here and how they can get rid of you. So I decided not to tell them my name and the standard pitch you you tell them your name. Hey, my name is Gene and whatever. So uh, what I did from a customer psychology standpoint is I don't tell them my name because the customer doesn't care. I also don't talk about the neighbors, all right? So in the standard sales pitch, they try to get you to talk about the neighbors to try to use that Jones effect to try to convince people to switch over. I don't talk about the neighbors at all, all right? I've taken all of that out and I found that from a customer psychology standpoint, it was much more effective. So one of the things missing is how we adapt what tools they give us in order to communicate more effectively with the customer based on understanding their psychology. So for example, I make an adjustment depending on the situation. So I'm gonna give an example, depending on the time of day. So this works if it's raining, uh, but this also works in the time of day. So let's just assume that it's 6.30 at night and it's dark, all right? So at 6.30, most people are having dinner. So instead of going through the standard sales pitch, what I do is say, well, I still start with how are you, 
But then I say, I'm so sorry to bother you. I can come back if I'm interrupting your dinner. This is the number one objection in the customer's mind. All right. Um, and either way, so the most common reply when I say, I'm so sorry, I can come back if you're interrupting dinner. The most common reply is, no, you're good. So that's American vernacular. That means that's all right. Go ahead and tell me quickly why you're here. Okay. So I've actually been given permission to say what I want to say next because the customer has said, no, you're good. Now, if they say, um, yeah, we're having dinner. Is it important? Or if they say, yeah, we're having dinner. Can you come back? That's okay too, because now you've been given permission to come back, which makes that follow-up conversation much more engaging. So when you come back the next day and you say, oh, I was here the day before, I was interrupting your dinner and I didn't want to do that. So I'm going to, I, I came back. Now you come back during the day, let's say at four, and you see that same person. Then that com that person is in their mind and says, okay, this person just left, did not interrupt my dinner, respected what I was doing. And now I'm going to give him more time to tell me what he has to do his sales pitch. So psychologically, when you follow the standard sales pitch, you'll be perceived as a salesperson. When you use empathy and awareness, okay, you'll be given permission and more time to help your prospect discover a solution. Now, I had only been in this business like eight weeks before I mastered it. And I discovered that only about one out of 100 customers you talk to will actually lead to a closed sale using that standard sales pitch. So for the people that I trained, I call it mastering the field is really about the other 99 people that you'll encounter. I'm going to go through this real quick. Uh, mastering the field is that standard pitch, that five steps to a conversation. It's what I call the standard pitch highway. And I told all the salespeople that I was training not to follow the standard pitch. Learn the standard pitch, but don't follow the standard pitch. Step one is your introduction. Um, does anybody know what C factors are? S E E. All right. Um, if anybody wants to raise their hand, if nobody knows what a C factor is, when you're talking to customers face to face. So I don't know what business you're in. Obviously, if you're in an online business, it's a different customer psychology. But when you're talking to people face to face, C factors is smiling eye contact, and enthusiasm. So what's really important is when that door is about to open, you prime yourself. You prime yourself to be smiling and having that enthusiasm. So when I hear people shuffling behind the door and getting ready to open the door, I'll just tell myself a little joke and I'll almost start laughing right as they open the door. And I say, hey, hey how are you doing? And of course, keeping it short and simple to get to the qualifying questions, which is your short story. So in this business, you want to know who your competitors are. Are, there, are they using Spectrum, which is a competitor? Uh, are they bundled, which means what services are they getting? And then what price are they paying? These are the, this is the information that you're trying to get in your short story. Now, one of the things that I discovered is you actually don't need the answer to all three of these questions. But in the, in the standard sales pitch, you got to ask all three of these questions. But for me, what was more successful, which helped me get to the top of the, you know, the sales, sales list, helped me get to the top is I only needed one or two. And then I would take an off ramp from the standard pitch. All right. Uh, the off ramp is basically how and what, how they use the internet and how they're, what they're using it for. And your off ramp questions are, are you experiencing lagging buffering? Do you have dead spots? Are you working from home? Anybody play competitive games, anything like that. And the key is you only need one off ramp. All right. Where a lot of salespeople lose their customers is they're asking too many questions without engaging. So once you have an off-ramp, then you start 
active listening. You start asking more relevant questions related to the answers that you've given. And then you start trying to build trust and making it make sense. And as soon as you have enough information, the customer feels that you care and you're listening to their problems. Then you get back on the on-ramp. And that's when you get into step three of the five steps to a conversation. You start talking about why you can solve their problem. And then, of course, you do the panda paws and the indifference. And you might say something like, I don't want to give you more than you need. I just want to give you the best solution. And that's how you get to the close and the rehash. And then assuming the sale is not assuming that the customer is going to buy, but having confidence that you can make it make sense for the customer. And this is what we call mastering the field. All right. So from August to December of last year, I learned, mastered, and began training frontier sales reps how to master the field of door-to-door -door sales. And what I learned is customer psychology uses very similar principles as cross-cultural communications, which is my area of expertise. All right, so uh, we're 30 minutes into our hour. Uh, we're gonna get into Q&A, but I wanna help everybody uh, ask questions that are more meaningful. And what do I mean by that? First, I want you to understand before you ask your question, what is the context? That means think about how you engage with your prospects. So for example, a customer who walks into an AT&T store that's looking for a solution has a different situational context than door-to-door -door sales, where you're knocking on a prospect's door and you're trying to initiate a conversation with someone who's actually not shopping for what you're offering. All right, so that's a completely different context. The way you would engage with somebody who walks in your store to the way you would engage with somebody who you knock on their door as a cold door knock. All right, so think about the context of how you're engaging your customers. The second one is, what is the sales goal? And what point in the customer journey is your prospect at? All right, so the example here is, before somebody decides to buy something, especially if it's a big ticket item, uh, there is a long customer journey. And I'm just gonna give an example. So there's a business where um, they have these large stores in the US like Costco's or Carrefour's. I think they have them in France or Europe. Uh, and sometimes at the Carrefour's they have people who set up these uh, kiosks or they stand around at these tables and they do what's called lead generation. All right. So people are walking through the stores and the salesperson's job is to try to generate leads for something like home improvement. You know, so people are going through the stores and they're being asked whether they want to upgrade their bathroom or upgrade their kitchen. All right. So that is the very, very beginning of their customer journey. It's called lead generation. Now, after you get the lead and the customer says, okay, yeah, I'm interested in possibly getting my kitchen cabinets upgraded or my bathroom redone, then somebody would be sent over to the house to set up a quotation. It might be a designer who, sh who will go through the different colors and the different options. So, but even if you get a quotation at your home, you haven't agreed to buy anything yet. But what I'm saying is that is a different point on the customer journey. The original lead generation, when the customer first learns about the possibility of upgrading their kitchen and the designer going over to their house and doing a custom quotation. That's a different point in the customer journey and it's a different psychology when you engage with those customers at those different points of their customer journey. Now, the final one before we get into Q&A is what is the objection? that you're trying to overcome, which means where are you losing your prospects, all right? In the case of Frontier and door-to-door -door sales, the biggest objection is they see the Frontier badge uh, that I'm wearing and they look at it and they say, Frontier, I hate Frontier. Your service was terrible and I'll never use your service again. 
that's oftentimes the first thing you hear when somebody opens the door and see that you're a representative from Frontier. And you would actually think that, well, there's zero chance to win this customer, so I should just move on to the next house. But with customer psychology, I've actually closed a lot of these types of customers. All right. I do that by saying something like, you hate Frontier. I don't say that, but when they say they hate Frontier, I just throw up my hands and say, well, that's exactly why I'm here. All right. And then I ask a question. I say, are you angry with Frontier because of our poor customer service in the past? Or was our internet service not what it was uh what not what it was supposed to be? Or was it both? I'm giving a customer a chance to vent their frustrations. What are you upset about? What are you angry about? And then whatever answer they give me, it doesn't even matter at this stage what answer they give me. I just nod and say, okay, okay. And then I might say something like, because we've made changes across the board based on feedback from customers like you, which is why Frontier is sending real people like me here today. All right, so I'm nodding, which demonstrates empathy. I'm acknowledging, which is a technique, a sales technique called mirroring, which you're just agreeing with the customer, making the customer feel like they can continue to talk. And then you personalize it by asking the right questions at the right time. Why were you angry? What did we do poorly? Uh, and then you're nodding like that. And then one final thing. Uh, in the U.S., you know that we have a very politically divisive environment. Okay, so if I'm in a neighborhood and I see a Trump banner in the yard of the house that I'm going to knock, all right, so they broadcast, you know, make America great again, and they got all these Trump banners in the yard. I went to a lot of neighborhoods that had a lot of Trump banners in the yard. I would follow up what I said, you know, which is why they send real people like me here today. And then I would add, so you don't have to be on the phone with someone in a call center reading from a script in God knows what country. All right. Now, I'm not injecting politics into anything, and I really don't care what anybody's politics are. And as a salesperson, you have to be aware of what the politics of the person that you are speaking to is. And you have to be emotionally intelligent enough to handle any racial or cultural biases. So I'm ethnically Chinese, so I'm going into these neighborhoods where there's a lot of Trump supporters. I have to find a way to figure out how to have a conversation. All right. So that's the end of the formal presentation. Uh, we're basically ready to open it up to Q&A now.